I realized that part of understanding really the language of comics is important to me, both as a reader but also as a creator. So I'm really, really digging into all that, all of that right now to try and better my craft. Today, I'm talking to artist Elsa Chartier. My name is Shah, and you are listening to Wit's End. Writer slash artist Elsa Chartier is back on Wit's End. And now that I think about it, it's been about a year since the first interview she did on the podcast. We talk about a lot this time. We go into Akira Kurosawa movies, the visual language of comics versus film, working in indie comics, doing your own thing versus working on a pre-established IP. We also go into her Kickstarter, her second art book, and what she's doing with that. We also go into November Volume 4, the book she's doing for Image Comics with writer Matt Fraction and colorist Matt Hollingsworth. The first time Elsa was on the podcast, she mentioned how the book would not be three books, but four, and the fourth one will be coming out this month. If you dig this conversation, please rate and review it on iTunes. Share it however you can. It would be greatly appreciated. But my talk with Elsa is coming up right now. How's the second Kickstarter going, by the way? Are you, that's done, right? No. Okay. Uh, I am finishing it up. Um, I have finished uh, the art book. It's like 99% done. Uh, The mini comic that I'm doing with uh, Chip Zdarsky is finished. And uh, the commentary edition is halfway done. So in about a week or so, everything will be off to the printers. And then we wait (laughs) for for this huge delivery and then uh, sketching and shipping. So there's still a fair amount of work to be done for the Mm -hmm. Kickstarter. But it's like going along nicely. I'm very happy. Yeah, like at this point... You're a veteran of Kickstarters, but like, is there anything that you learned with the first one that you want to do better with this one or anything that you might do more efficiently? Well, I wouldn't call myself a veteran. You know, it's my second or technically third Kickstarter, but the first one was seven years ago. So things have, you know, had changed quite a bit between the, the first and the second Kickstarter. Um, but yes, I do. There are of course stuff that you learn as you do them. And on the top of my head, uh, what do I have? Yeah. You know, map out the campaign as much as possible in advance. But I actually did after the first Kickstarter, I did a postmortem of all the things that could be improved in case we were to do a second campaign. And so I used that because we forget, you know, from one year to another, you kind of forget the things that went wrong and the Mm -hmm. things that went right. So I have a whole list of things like to keep in mind and to try and improve. Um, But the the, the last year's campaign was, went great. So I didn't have like a huge amount of stuff to change for that second one. But I would say that the major part was plan for success yeah. <laughs> which I hadn't done in a enough for the previous Kickstarter I, got, I kind of got caught off guard because it yeah. went so well and so quickly like going in blind the first time it's like how do I do everything and then this time you actually have a plan yes a bit a bit more and also I I had took uh, some time off to do the campaign Because uh, if you're, I think that last year I tried to work and manage the campaign and I quickly realized that that was not an option. If I wanted to do like this really well and be uh, on top of things, I had to allow enough time for it. So I, I, I had to put work aside for a couple of weeks and of course then I was late and it was a whole thing. (laughs) So this year I was like, okay, I'm, taking like three weeks off drawing to do a Kickstarter campaign because it's a full-time job, really. Mm -hmm. 
was that first one. I've talked to people who have been doing Kickstarters and they started doing them during COVID and everyone does things differently, but how many, was it you doing the Kickstarter, like doing everything or did you have like a group of people? <laughs> uh, there's two of us. So me and my partner, who's also a writer, uh, whose name is Pierre Collinet. Uh, so it's just the two of us. Uh, mm -hmm. but you know two people full time that's you know a lot so we yeah. had we had enough time to to handle everything just the two of us but for shipping we we'll, we're going to hire outside help not to not to actually handle the fulfilling because you know you can delegate all that part have your book uh, your books shipped to someone else that will handle like printing labels and all that stuff. Um, I want to keep a close eye on this. I want to, you know, feel responsible. So uh, we're going to do it ourselves, but we'll hire some local young folks to <laughs> to pack things up <laughs> because uh, we have a lot of uh, packages to send out. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned you're not doing drawing or anything. Did you stop doing commissions? Or are you going to stop commissions until the Kickstarter is over? I have basically stopped uh, commissions and for the foreseeable future because um, so I have a few to finish, like six or seven are left on my previous list, but I will not be taking any more commissions because I have um, chronic pains in my hands, my drawing hand and also the other one. And so I try to keep drawing um, at a minimum, <laughs> yeah. which is a bit weird because I am an artist and it's primarily, you know, what I do. Uh, but yes, uh, if I draw too much, my hand hurts. So I have to manage all of that. And commissions are not that's something that I do on the side, but it's not my job. Mm -hmm. You know, my job is to put out comics. So yeah, I, I, I'm not going to be taking commission for, for a while now. Yeah, I mean, on the commission note, I was really stoked about that Rashomon one you posted months ago. <laughs> I reached out to you too about that one where it was just like, Akira Kurosawa was one of my favorite directors. So seeing like someone oh, asking too. for a commission is amazing. Yeah, um, um, I actually, I opened um, a movie commission list because I, you know, I enjoy drawing superheroes, but um, after the 10th Batman, yeah. <laughs> the 15th Catwoman, it's nice to uh, make things up and to be able to, to do, to draw and explore different things. And I, I like movies a lot. And so I figured that it would be interesting and, you know, a different exercise to try and sum up either a scene from a movie or an entire movie or just a single character, you know, that depends on what the commissioner wants. But I, th I thought that could be a really nice exercise and it proved to be super, super fun. <laughs> I did about, I think, a, a dozen or so um, and I had so much fun. It was really, really fun. Normally, I ask people, what was your first run-in with Jack Kirby? I've mentioned Jack Kirby like every episode so far, but this time I was wondering what your first run-in with Akira Kurosawa was, because my first one was Seven Samurai. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, I think I had, it was a long time, you know, coming. I knew that at some point I'd have to, not that I felt obligated, but I somehow never got around to watch a Kurosawa movie. Uh, but I knew he was on my list of people uh, whose work that I had to know. And I think I, I watched a bunch of um, YouTube videos about, about compositions and, and kinetic movements and all of that. And, and of course, Seven Samara kept popping up yeah. in those videos because it's like it's a masterclass in composition and, and just about everything. And so at some point I was like, okay, I've got to watch that movie, <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, understand why and it is so good and just immerse myself in his work and universe. And I was, of course, blown away. And, uh, uh, and of course, I watched some more of his movies after that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that movie, I like my dad was really into Westerns. So when one time <laughs> when I was a kid, we watched uh, Magnificent Seven together. And at that time, I was just like, eh, okay, whatever. And then you learn, hey, it's based on a movie about samurai. So I was like, holy shit, that's cooler. And then I went to watch that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course. And I think it's uh, Kurosawa is probably not something that a young, you know, teen would be into because it's, you know, uh, some of these movies are, uh, they take their time, you know, and it's not, <laughs> it's some, I think it's a bit of an acquired taste, yeah. you know, to have, to know why it's good and to be able to understand exactly what is happening on a comp- on a composition levels on a on a you know uh, thematic level all of those things that I think would go over a teen's head or at least myself as a teen I know I would have just like this is no fun <laughs> yeah it's like today like going back and watching those, it makes me way more excited to watch like Yojimbo for the seventh time versus like, oh, another Avengers movie. And it, it's not that I'm anti Avengers. If you have to pick like a superhero movie, the Avengers are, you know, kind of the, the best ones, I guess. Um, I'm partial to Blade 3. No, um, it's. I don't know. It's a preference. Like I remember like Martin Scorsese had his whole thing where he's like superhero movies are not <laughs> cinema and everyone on Twitter lost their shit. And it was just like, yeah, that was a, that was an old, old fart moment from, from him. <laughs> okay. So, so you were like, you don't know what you're talking about or like you were. No, against... I wouldn't go as far as to judge Scorsese. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was like, okay, well that's, his way of saying things, you know, uh, he, of course, is a fantastic director and one of my favorite directors, but he's also an old man. We can't ask him to be uh, as maybe open-minded as a 20 or 30 something, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's, in, he's entitled to thinking that of those movies. I mean, I'm fine with it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess if you've made, you know, Raging Bull, Goodfellas, all of those, you're entitled to say it's, something. It's on an, <laughs> it is, it is on, you know, another <laughs> level. Like, how many movies has he made? That's how many, like, you know, inflammatory remarks he has. Like, for what mm-hmm. each movie he can say something, where it's like, <laughs> yeah. Iron Man is for children. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm tempted to give him some slack because I just love his movies so much. Yeah. <laughs> and I would actually have a script from him, a signed script that I that I gifted my boyfriend a few years ago for his birthday. It's a script from The Departed that's framed in our studio. So I'm like, Scorsese is my that's favorite. That's amazing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I was wondering, like, as an artist, when you're watching something like a Kurosawa movie or any movie, because Kurosawa has that visual language, like you're watching Yojimbo and each character has their own like body language. You can look at them from a distance and when uh, Tashira Mifuna does like the shoulder roll <laughs> thing, like you, you, you know it's him. Like, are there things that you take away yeah. from movies where it's like, I can put this into the work to make that part of the visual language? Uh, you mean when I am, um, you know, generally speaking or when i'm doing a piece on a specific movie i mean it can be both if it's for like a project or like one of those uh like movie commissions okay so on movie commissions of course because you can't so the i had a severin samurai piece to do and it was a toshiro mifune um, commission and of course i mean you can you can just put the silhouette of him, you know, yelling with this, you know, sword in hand yeah. under the, the, the rain and just the silhouette of him, you know, which character it's going to be because, you know, those, like you said, shoulders and the bendy legs as he's just walking around, like it's, it's so unique. And he actually carries that sure in most of the films that he did with Kurosawa. Um, in Rashomon, he's kind of like that too. When he, you know, he kind of, runs walks it's a, it's a bit 
weird um, thing that he has going that is so unique to him and to his characters. So of course I take that and, and, and that goes into the commission because huge part of a character. Um, as for using using that in a in a in a book, maybe for a different character, I actually had never thought of doing that, <laughs> which is like kind of dumb. Um, but yes, I should. I, I definitely should. <laughs> Can you just and adapt the Seven Samurai into a graphic novel? Like that would be fine. Like we could. <laughs> I am tempted. You know, I sometimes I'm. I'm really, really tempted when I watch a movie or read a book that I really love to just do a shot by shot adaptation. Yeah. Because just the pleasure that I would drive from recreating a panel like that. And then I remember comics are more than uh, movies on paper. It, it wouldn't take, it wouldn't do justice to comics to start doing those sort of things because it would just be like storyboards, basically. Uh, but the whole adaptation of either a, a movie or a graphic novel is something that is fantastic when it's done right. And I'm thinking of the Slaughterhouse Five uh, yeah. books that they just you know, that um, uh, uh, Albert Montes and Riot North. I want to say that his name, right? I, I I know you're I what you're talking Norse? about, like the the Kurt Vonnegut. They did like the I think that's him of the book. Um, yes, and that is a fantastic from what I've seen because I haven't been able to buy it because it's just out of stock. I think they it just blew up and they didn't anticipate it such a huge success, so I couldn't order it. But I saw a few pages, and you can see, and I compared it to the prose of the book, and that is a, a graphic novel adaptation they took exactly the right amount of element and translated it into comic book um, language. Um, so that's, that would be the way to go. But I don't think a Kurosawa is, would be a good director to, um, to, to be adapted in graphic novel because his visual language is so unique that you can't go ahead and mess with it, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's something but I that I'm tempted I've... sometimes to adapt, you know, some of the books or movies that I loved. Just like as a personal <laughs> thing. No, no, no. Yeah, it's fine. And <laughs> like I've been talking to people about this and it's something I've been wondering just how each person, like what each person's preference is. And is it kind of like comics are good enough as comics? They don't need to be something else. Like you don't need to write a comic to become a movie or a TV show and you don't need to turn a movie into something else. Yes. Um, yeah, but if you're, are you referring to like the um, increased amount of adaptation for, from comic books? Is that what you're referring to? It's, it's kind of back to the thing that we're talking about and also like... Mm sometimes comics are written as like they're written for tv like it's a comic yes. and then it's going to become a tv show okay so i am um i am a you know not against it not for it i understand the creator's perspective because comics are so hard to sell it's really hard to make a living especially with creator owned comic books so if you have the opportunity to pitch a book that could be adapted and potentially allow you to do your work for the rest of your life without having to worry about money, I mean, I say go for it. <laughs> yeah. it's, so it's, it's, it's not an, an... And we live in a moment where uh, creators, comic book creators, have that opportunity right now because most of the stuff that get produced are existing IPs. It's just how it is now. Uh, so I say that we should use that to our own advantage. It's it's not something that we we should turn up our nose to and say, oh, we don't need to be adapted into movies because comic books are enough, you know, as it is, as they are, as a medium. And I also agree with that. Where I kind of uh, disagree is when... A story has no 
no um how can i put that uh when a story is not a comic book it's a movie pitch or a tv show pitch that is done in a comic book form just to exist as an ip does that make sense Okay, that's actually a better way of putting what I was talking about, where... Not every story is a comic book. Mm -hmm. it, and it's something that I that, that took me a while to understand. I was like, why can't it be? Because ultimately, comics is a, is a very um, unique medium, and the language of comic books is very... Um, has its strength that not every story can take advantage of so that's where where i'm kind of like let's take advantage of you know being able to make a living by selling out our ideas but let's also make sure that we don't uh, ruin comics by just pitching tv stuff through our books yeah you know because so that's my point but yeah. i don't know if i'm right or wrong <laughs> i mean i don't know if there's a right answer i mean you know like some of the superhero movies make a lot of money and I'm not knocking superhero movies. I'm not, I'm not trying to be Scorsese, <laughs> like young Scorsese, but like it's, it's not like the books are selling as much as the movies are. Like, it's not like you watch the TV show, like not walking dead case, was really yeah. big and mm. people aren't going to be like storming comic book shops to buy a walking dead comic. Like sometimes people I will just stick to that one thing, that one medium. Yeah, I don't think that a su success of a book or, sorry, success of a TV show um, has an impact on sales of the actual IP it's based on. I don't think it, it's ever translated into sales for the books. Or very, you know, it's minimal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um... I, like I said, again, I don't know if there's a right answer. I don't know if there's, you know, an ultimate solution, but yeah, go for I it. think that the right answer is, are you doing the best you can to put out a great book? And then if that books can get adapted, that is fantastic, you know, but, you know, churning out ideas after ideas after ideas in the hope of one of them will get picked for a TV show or a movie I don't think that's a great approach to to our medium and our work, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but I used to be a bit more like, oh, we're doing comics and uh, we don't need to be adapted and our job is to, just to do comics. And then you realize, if I could have one of my ideas bought by a studio, I could do comics and graphic novels almost like without having to worry about money for the rest of my life. I mean, I'm going to take that chance if it presents yeah. itself. <laughs> that's Yeah, that's totally fair. And I don't know, I, I was talking to someone a few months ago where they were like, I want to be like a European graphic novelist where they can put out one book like every few years and they're just set for it's life. It's everyone's dreams. No one's, no one, I think, or very few artists want to uh, put out so many pages. You know, we all want to take our time, <laughs> but yeah. we can't. Or it's hard. A but also... Like an, yeah, go for it. Sorry, going back to the European comics and all of that. Um, so I'm from France. Mm -hmm. So I'm a bit more... I'm a bit closer to that industry. Although I've never actually worked in French comics. Uh, it is not as idyllic as American artists tend to think. You know, um, European artists don't produce as many books, but they also... Uh, don't make as much money. So, you know, it's not less work for the same amount of money. It's less work for less money. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you cleared that up. And I wasn't trying to, like, misinform or, like, it, it was mm. more like a no, hyperbole, like an exaggerated... Mm -mm. And, and uh, I've talked to American artists who, um, whose work either got bought for a French adaptation or they got hired to do a book for a French publisher and they have good rates. And so they're like, oh my God, I want to, you know, oh, you French artists are so lucky. But uh, American artists have a different set of contracts and agreements and rates that are much more favorable. Um, so, yeah. 
the, the, the local artists are not treated treated as well. The local artists in uh, like somewhere like France aren't treated as well. Yes, okay. French, um, Italy, Belgium, or Europe, basically. Yeah. I was going to bring up November, but I was wondering like mm-hmm. why that is. Is it again because of the contracts? Like, um, so I'm not too familiar with the with the industry here, so I don't want to say anything that is not true. Uh, but I think it has to do with, it used to be much better, maybe like 20 years ago or so. And then the, the rates for artists just dropped. And I think there was a change in contracts or it, it all, it, it, I don't know why exactly, I can't remember, but it all changed and it's become much more difficult. But publishers know that it's different in the States. And so they also know that it can't, Uh, offer the same terrible working conditions to American artists because they wouldn't be able to attract anyone. So they have different rates and different conditions, working conditions for um, foreign artists, which is, you know, (laughs) it is, it's, it's enraging to, to know that, but I know for sure that it's not the same conditions because they know that American artists would never go (laughs) for such low rates. The, that's yeah that's a little bit infuriating where it's kind of like a wizard of oz like don't look behind the curtain and you'll see oh yeah the that's exactly it and we we try to you know uh keep up that uh appearance of uh creative heaven yeah <laughs> I mean, it's not it's not it at all yeah i mean but i wanted to cover november and i was wondering you've mm-hmm. done books for like marvel you've done star wars does something like november offer you more creative freedom do you actually get to take your time with something like november versus something like oh hey star wars or a marvel book mm, so i don't get to take my time because we were also on a monthly schedule although we were released as you know um hardcovers um, of 60 pages of art. My schedule was like 20 pages a month. Mm-hmm. So I didn't get to take my time, but I did get 100% creative freedom. You know, I could do what I want. Oh, of course, I had I have a partner, Matt Fraction. So um, everything I wanted to do, I run past him because we're a team, of course. Um, but in terms of... Uh, you know, creative freedom, it's not, uh, you can't even compare that to mainstream comics. Although I had fun working on existing characters, um, it is it is different to work on your own characters and to know that you can make decisions and not have to ask for anyone's approval. <laughs> and in the end, I feel like more fulfilled. Um, by that approach to 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 comics and to to creativity, mm-hmm. the, like mainstream yeah. has a thing, and then your independent books have a different situation. Yeah, and also I think that the fact that it is our property, and the fact that there is no one we're we're the captains of the boat. No one is telling us, especially with image. I mean, if you don't uh, produce the pages. Well, there you go. There's no book. <laughs> yeah. No one's going to be behind you and telling you, oh, your deadline's this day or that day. Uh, so being in charge and having that responsibility empowers you, empowers me. Uh, mm. I don't know if that's the case for everyone, but uh, it makes me feel like I really, really have to produce the, be- the best work that I can because this is us. This is ours and only ours. Um, so I felt like a sense of responsibility more. And um, maybe it has to do with the fact that I didn't grow up uh, reading comics. I started reading comics when I was like 24, 25, something like that. Um, and I am not a fan of any existing character, whether it's DC or Marvel Universe. You know, I'm not dying of drawing Superman or Spider-Man, like you said. Yeah. Um, so I don't have that 
um, almost visceral needs that some young artists have. Or my goal in life is to draw Superman, and I respect that totally. Uh, it's just not mine. So I feel more um, the drive to create is more important when it's my own characters that I co-created rather than working on a um, Spider-Man or Batman or even though I, I realize the honor that it is to be asked to to participate to that universe, I don't. I'm not. Um, I'm not saying that it's less good uh, or that I um, look down on it. Not at all. It's just less. It motivates me less. <laughs> if that makes mm-hmm. sense. If that makes sense. And there are more books than just Marvel and DC. As someone who grew up, like my first comics were Jack Kirby's Fantastic Four. I read mm-hmm. those, you know, Marvel books growing up. But at this point, it's like there's more than just that. When people are like, <gasps> pick one or especially the other. Right n- yeah. Yeah, especially right now. There are, there are so many um, graphic novels or even monthly titles that are not DC or Marvel. You know, Boom Studios, uh, Image, uh, Vault Comics, all of those editors that are putting out so many books. <laughs> there is a lot to choose from. Um, as a especially reader, it's when fantastic. Batman, and I didn't mean to cut you off, but especially when Batman has ten books at one time. <laughs> I I've stopped reading. I never really read monthly um, comics. You know, DC and Marvel. I never, you know, I never picked a monthly title for, from DC or Marvel. It's just never really been my thing. Mm-hmm. I have th- those. Um, you know, um, legendary books, the Batman Year Once, the, the, the Darwin Cook's Catwoman's, all of those, I have them because it's, you know, it's books that, um, yes, they are DC and Marvel, but there are also, um, you know, books that are the produce of something very unique from their creators. It's not, you can see that they are unique and they stood the taste of time, you know, 10 to 20 years later we're still reading them and still it's still those are still fantastic books so I have um all of those and I love them but you know I never really got into the picking up monthly titles uh I don't know why it's just um I prefer the graphic novels and all of that stuff uh, especially more and more and more now mm-hmm. And it's the creators who make the stories what they are. It's not like the IP. Like Batman doesn't make you want to read Batman. You probably like Batman because it's, you know, Frank Miller or Neil Adams or someone did that book. I don't know I'm throwing Batman out there again after I just said <laughs> Batman has 10 books. But... No, no, I, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, send the record straight. I'm not, you know, <laughs> shitting, yeah. shitting on Batman and all that. I, I, I think... Uh, there are some great stories that are out there, even even right now. You know that are being drawn and, and, and written, and it's and it's rich. And I think in, to some level, editors have been allowing more and more freedom to creators, even within those licensed properties constraints. Um, but it's just personally, it's less my thing than 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 the graphic novels or you know um, from um abrams or for seconds and all of those editors publishers Mm -hmm. sorry but i was wondering what you're checking out right now like movies uh comics whatever i have bought uh in the past month a um a ridiculous ridiculously huge amount of books (laughs) I have been stockpiling graphic novels. So, uh, what did I buy? Uh, Blankets that I have never read. Yeah, Craig Thompson. Um, Yes. Um, Oh, God. Why can't I remember? Ping Pong, the manga. Uh, That that I've... uh, It has just been translated in in English just Mm -hmm. very recently. I haven't is, read is it Dark yet. Horse putting out that English translation? Because they do a lot I don't of... Think so. okay. No, I don't think so. Uh, let me check. Um, I have some um, Sergio Topi that I bought recently. Um, 
uh, some uh, Linda Berry's books and all of that. And I have a huge pile of stuff that I need to go through. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm trying to read very different things. Um, uh, because I also, um, so I don't know when you're going to put this out, uh, but um, I have been working on a YouTube channel for a little while and part of those videos i need to do some research so i'm deep in research mode <laughs> yeah is uh, it so yeah. <laughs> okay yeah that's cool um yeah. it's i'm also like you're mentioning all the stuff you're reading i'm looking over at my like three foot tall like toddler size reading pile over there <laughs> and sweating because it's like you do keep buying things and you don't get around to them but is the youtube thing something you'd be okay with throwing in there that's not something like hold off on it until you announce it or can I just no 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 it's 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 been you know out there that I'm working on something that we are actually working on something uh I haven't given any more um details because I want to keep most of it under wrap yeah so I won't stay I, I won't say more for now but it's it's going to be occupying my time quite a bit because I need to cut down on drawing a little bit. So I need yeah. something else to, to keep busy. And the more we've been working on that, the more I, 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 I realize that part of um, understanding, you know, really the language of comics is important to me, both as a reader, but also as a creator. So I'm really, really um, digging into all that, all of that right now to try and better my craft and and be able to talk about it better and I don't want to say explain because that's not it I'm not a teacher but to try and share my love for comics I prefer that that sounds exciting because I prefer especially with someone who knows what they're talking about and has been in the business and knows the craft of comics that's way better than someone just explaining Dark Knight Returns for the 30th fucking time. I don't need to, like, I, I prefer that when it's just, aside from someone who's just explaining the plot of a thing to you, where it's like, I could read this myself and just get that information. Yeah, no, we're really into, um, into dissecting sequential storytelling. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, we can leave it there. But, um... <laughs> We, we kind of, we've kind of covered the Kickstarter. We kind of covered November. Is there anything you want to throw out there that we think that you think we left out or anything that we didn't cover? Um, I am starting, it hasn't been announced yet, but I have a new series coming in this year, 2021. That is going to be um, an ongoing and it's going to be really, really fun and hopefully quite huge. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, that's another thing that we can just leave, you know, just leave it at that until there's more news yeah. about it. Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, but aside from that, is there anything you want to throw out there or because I think we're closing up. So I think like I'm good. Yeah, if you are. no, that's about it. I'm just very happy to be talking to you <laughs> and it's fun to, to have some human interactions. <laughs> yes. Um, I think that's really the, the purpose of this. This is why I, I don't do it for fame and glory and money. It's just like, I need people to talk to. So. <laughs> you know, I'm working with, you know, people for my art book or, or, and or other stuff. And, what could be done over email? I'm like, do you want to do you want a video chat real quick? Yeah, <laughs> I need to be talking to people, actual people. It, it, it's the opposite <laughs> of what you would normally do, where it's like, just send yes. me the email and I'll skip it. Yeah. It's like, it's, can we talk live? Like, <laughs> can like, we do I those Zoom meetings again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw that um, someone that I you know that I know that is that is you know has a regular job. So their job right now is like 10 hours of Zoom meetings. I was like, I'm so sick of those Zoom meetings. And like, you actually get to talk and see people. I don't see anyone and I haven't seen anyone in over a year. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's enjoy that human interaction. We've all become agoraphobic at this point where it's just like you go outside. You know, and like, I'm, wait, I'm there's really, a world I'm, I'm, I am monitoring myself because I have a tendency 
towards agoraphobia, I could easily not like decide not to go out of my house yeah, uh, ever again. <laughs> so yes, so I'm like, I'm, and I'm forcing myself to have a walk outside every day to like not go into bunker mode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be hard on, on a lot of people after this is done uh, to actually get back to normal because we're all wanting to be getting back to normal, but can we? <laughs> yeah, there's, I don't know. There's, you can't, you know, Pandora's box, as cliche as that saying is, it's open. You can't put everything yeah. back where it was. So, yeah. But anyway, we have comics to read in our bunkers. <laughs> <laughs> so this is good yeah but um again i'm glad we worked out a time to talk again i'm glad you came yeah me too and i'm looking forward to seeing the new work as always everyone's information can be found in the description of the episode all of elsa's information is down there mine as well as always you can follow me on twitter at underscore shaw comics be sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at WitsEndPod. Visit WitsEndPod.com for full videos, reviews, episodes, write-ups. It gets updated regularly, and it's the best place to keep up with everything WitsEnd related. If you would like to support the podcast, I have a Ko-Fi or Coffee page. What I do is post updates on the podcast. I post indie slash Kickstarter projects that I'm really excited for. So if you want a list of cool things to check out, just go check out that Ko-Fi slash Coffee link however you say it. The best way to support the podcast would be to rate and review on iTunes, share it however you can. If you enjoy these conversations, a rating or review would go a long way. As always, there are weekly episodes. There are more episodes in the backlog, so check those out. A lot of Jack Kirby-related videos and podcasts. But as always, thank you for listening. Take care. Stay safe. Chaos ensues.